From Wondery, I'm Nikki Boyer, and this is Call Me Curious, where every week I'll get to the bottom of those funny, strange, puzzling, or just gotta know questions you have. And we'll tell you the best we can what the answer is. Cause I've got 21 questions, I've been 21 guessing, you could teach me a lesson. Call me curious, call me curious. Hi, welcome to Call Me Curious. Let's talk about breakfast. Everybody likes a bit of bacon crisp and lean. I have a love-hate relationship with breakfast, meaning I hate how much I love it. Seriously, when I die, I want to be buried on a bed of French toast. I adore breakfast so much that when I do allow myself the luxury, I like to take my time with it, right? And get all buttery. I'm looking at you, biscuits and gravy. Oh, so good. But like many people, my mornings are busy, so most days I actually don't end up eating until around noon. And all morning, I hear this little voice inside my head echoing, but breakfast is the most important meal of the day. We've heard that phrase our entire lives, right? And it seems so common sense that we never bother to question it. But let's take a step back here, okay? Where did that notion even come from? And more importantly, is it even true? Is breakfast the most important meal of the day? Well, we'll find out on this episode of Call Me Curious, the most important podcast you'll listen to all day. So right now I'd like to welcome the pop to my snap and crackle, my good friend, Mr. Malone. Hi, Maloney. Oh, hi, Nikki. I love that introduction. That's so good. And I'm right there with you about breakfast. I like what you said about like that little voice saying, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Right. It drives me nuts because it's making me feel like I have to eat when I don't want to eat. Really? Nikki, I love breakfast food. Right. I don't like breakfast. And the thought of food in the morning, forget it. Okay. <laughs> well, I love breakfast food. Uh, yeah. It's actually some of my favorite food. I love that you can wake up, right? Yeah. You can drive to a little place. You can order your tea or your coffee, and then you get something savory, like an omelet and hash browns with <laughs> sautéed onions and spinach. And then next to your breakfast, you get to order dessert, which is a pancake. And you get to like slather and lather that up with butter and syrup. So you get all of the things that you love in one meal, which is savory. And then also you get to eat dessert at the same time. It's it's It's, perfection, but I'm with you, right? Sometimes in the morning, I'm just not hungry. Yes. So I'm curious to know, what does America think of breakfast? So we sent our very own Dax Jordan out to the streets to take some orders. I'm at the park asking people about breakfast and whether they think it's the most important meal of the day. Is it? The debate rages on. All right, here's some uh, potential nutritionists. Hey, guys, do you think breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Yes, I do. You do? Have you had breakfast today? Uh, I had Starbucks today. Breakfast of champs. And how about you? Do you think breakfast is the most important meal of the day? No. Ooh, what is the most important meal? Like midday, lunch. Fantastic. Uh, One divisive question. Sorry to get political. Bacon or sausage? Bacon. Vegan bacon. Vegan bacon. There you go. But for you, just pure meat. Yeah. (laughs) Let's see. Here's somebody. Uh, Hello, my friend. Do you think breakfast is the most important meal of the day? No. No. What is the most important meal of the day? Whichever meal you decide to start your day with. Does that make it breakfast? No. Fantastic. Uh, Do you think breakfast is the most important meal of the day? I would say for me and my body, yes. Okay, how about you, sir? Do you believe it's the most important meal of the day? I only eat it about 50% of the time, so I guess not. (laughs) I a lot of times don't eat until noon, and I don't know if we're calling that breakfast anymore. I wonder sometimes if it's just the first meal of the day, is that breakfast? Maybe it's a philosophical question. Uh, Last question. If you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few heads. Heads, that's right. You got to break some heads if you want to get to those eggs. eggs. (laughs) (laughs) All right, these guys are feeding the geese breakfast, so they must believe in breakfast. Um, Do you uh, believe that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? I think so, yeah. 
What's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten for breakfast? Oh, um, ice cream sundae. Wow, ice cream sundae for breakfast. Uh, how old were you when you did this? It's about a month ago. <laughs> a month ago. Do you think that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Yes, I do agree. Definitely a breakfast person. What's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten for breakfast? I think leftovers from Indian food. Wow, leftover Indian food. So like cold palak paneer in the morning. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, complete this popular breakfast theme phrase. If you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few. Eggs. Windows, because they stop serving breakfast at 1030 and you're very upset. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, Nikki, that was Rudy Tooty fresh and fruitful. Back to you. Huh, this is interesting. It's kind of a mixed mm. bag, wouldn't you say? It, you know, it really is. It's like it's a little own mixed up omelet. <laughs> To oh my God, I love it. But um, I'm so glad that we booked a couple of guests today because we're actually going to get some real legit answers. So today we are chatting with a dietitian slash nutritionist who's going to give us her take on eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. But first, we have an award-winning food writer, commentator, and creator of the popular blog Voodoo and Sauce. And she's also the author of several fascinating books, including Breakfast, A History. So let's raise some toast to Heather Arndt Anderson. Heather. Hi, Heather. Welcome to Call Me Curious. <laughs> Hi. 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 Good morning. Top of the morning to you both. <laughs> Top of the Yay. morning. Hey, Did you have breakfast today? <laughs> <laughs> I uncharacteristically did have breakfast today. Um, I had a pineapple fritter. My husband, I, I usually don't eat breakfast. Mm. It's just I'm a coffee. Pineapple fritter. Yeah, there was um, a donut shop across the street from the dentist office, um, and my husband had an appointment this morning, so he hit the drive through and brought me a little Danish. Oh, that's oh true, love, and that's yeah. funny that there's a yeah. donut shop across from the dentist office. That's good planning. <laughs> That's my kind of breakfast, though, <laughs> coffee and a donut. All right, so Heather, I'm so happy that you're here. First of all, can you tell us about the origin of the, that statement that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Where did that come from? Yeah, it came from a woman named Lena Cooper. She was a dietitian and a uh, huge proponent of vegetarian diets. Uh, she was a protege of John Harvey Kellogg's, of, you know, the Kellogg's, Kellogg's brand um, cereals that we know and love or whatever <laughs> or don't love. Right. And, uh, yeah, it, was, it appeared in a publication that she wrote an article just uh, – it, it was in the late teens – she just mentioned kind of offhand that because the breakfast foods or the, the first meal is the one that gets your your motor running or puts gas in your tank, that that um, could be construed as the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, she would have had a lot of support from Kellogg to go with this. And Kellogg would have loved running with this idea because he had cereal to sell. And uh, yeah, so it just went from there. Interesting. And that how it always happens. Somebody says something that's important and then they, like, create an entire, you know, branding campaign around this one thing, and then it turns into something that maybe it wasn't intended to. That's fascinating. So what were people actually eating before Kellogg had his grand idea of cereals? I think that prior to that, people just ate in the morning because they had laboring to do. Um, kids had caloric needs because they had a lot of learning to do. But really, um, people didn't give much thought to it. And it became a very heavily marketed meal more than anything else. Um, it, which, it's funny, all these slogans and things that I remember learning as a kid, I'm now, as I'm getting older, starting to understand the marketing plan behind all of it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wait a minute. <laughs> so going back to um, Kellogg, because he sounded like he was kind of a genius in some ways, also a little bit of a weirdo. Yeah, he was a big time eugenicist Yikes. in addition Ew. to him being <clears throat> part of the the kind of the Jacksonian era clean living movement. So yeah, he had a, a strong interest in promoting more of what we consider to be, you know, health food or clean eating. Um he had a, he was running a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan where rich people would come and stay and do hydrotherapy and do these fasts and crazy yogurt enemas. And um, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie The Road to Wellville, but it's based more than a little bit loosely on Kellogg and the Battle Creek Sanitarium. 
So he was part of these same guys like Sylvester Graham, who really frowned on caffeine and spicy foods and anything really heavy. They were all vegetarians um, because they thought that spicy foods or stimulants or anything heavy would inflame the sexual desires and lead to other um, bad things. And so... Yeah, if you've got a taste for spicy food, you might have a taste for other spicy stuff that's sinful. Hey, now. Really? <laughs> God willing, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, I remember reading about this, Malone. This is fascinating. So Kellogg was kind of like, he was a super religious moralist who was against sex. So what's interesting here is that you think, oh, well, he created all of these sugary cereals, which kind of increases, you know, your yeah. energy level, makes you... But in the beginning, when he first decided to create cornflakes. It was basically keeping things bland, making them filling so you could curb your impure thoughts. So originally, cereals were created to basically, I guess, curb your sex drive. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, the cornflakes were kind of an accidental invention. He didn't set out to create a breakfast cereal. He was making something else and had to run off to a meeting and uh, everything that was in the pot got boiled down. And so he, you know, wanting to keep an eye on his bottom line, he ran this, you know, like dry paste through some rollers and it like flaked up and he tested it on the the patients or the clients at the sanitarium and people liked it. But then his his brother, um, Will, wanted to add sugar to make the products more shelf stable. And that was when they had this fraternal rift because John was like adamantly against adding sugar. Um, Will Keith Kellogg really wanted to be able to sell the stuff. And the only way to do that was to, you know, make a product that would be able to stand on shelves without going rancid. And so the Kellogg cereals that we know today are the inventions of John's, uh, you know, brother. So he was the one who who kind of made the Kellogg's brand as we know it. So interesting. This history is so wacky. I love it. Yeah. And also like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, I have to say, um, I love that breakfast cereal and sex are closely tied. I think there's a whole podcast about just that topic. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> um, but this is fascinating. So um, reading your book, Heather, Breakfast, A History, it seems like everything that we think of as breakfast food is kind of the result of a marketing campaign or some political lobbying effort. Yeah, it's definitely true for American breakfast foods, but the bacon and eggs thing, um, people are often curious about how that became a, a winning duo. And it was because the Beechnut Corporation wanted to sell more bacon. And so they hired this marketing guru, Edward Bernays, who turned out to be the nephew of Sigmund Freud, if that tells you how good he was at his job. He knew a thing or two about <laughs> wow. psychological manipulation. Oh, um, so funny. He, he polled um, all these doctors and he framed the, the question just right. He's like, in your opinion, is eating a heavy or hearty breakfast more healthy than eating a light breakfast? And the doctors were like, sure, okay. And then he was like, okay, and did, would you consider bacon and eggs to be a heavy breakfast? And they're like, yeah. I guess. And he's like, there, doctor said it. Bacon and eggs is a healthy breakfast. And he ran with it. And um, yeah, and I, I made a joke in my book that within a couple of years, the American Heart Association was formed. So, wow. Um, we'll oh, just, my God. That plays a <laughs> more than a coincidence. That's terrible. <laughs> Uh, same thing with orange juice. Um, orange juice and grapefruits, like citrus juices, uh, became yeah. really part of the breakfast table because of um, mm-hmm. the flu pandemic. And so, yeah, the like market, the citrus growers started marketing the juices as like a cure all for flu and um, and to promote drinking it in the morning or you know with you know more meals than just breakfast. But um, yeah, a lot. And then of course, cereal breakfast cereals were the first products marketed directly to children um, mm-hmm. with cartoon figures and toys toys and things, mm-hmm. and really appealing to the power that children have over their harried mothers who just don't want to deal with it. Um, I and mean, it makes sense because breakfast cereal is one of the first things a kid can learn how to make for themselves without their mom's Absolutely. help. Absolutely. Remember that, Nikki, all yes. the sugar? My mom was very picky about those cereals, though, with the sugar. She was, you know, they were, she was very on it with that. Like, you can't, that's too much sugar for you. I remember waking up in the morning and immediately thinking, like, which one am I going to have? It was almost like a little fix for myself, right? Because <laughs> yes, I, I wanted the Cocoa Pebbles because I wanted the chocolate milk. Oh, and then Cocoa I also Pebbles. wanted the Fruit Loops because I loved that. I thought, by the way, Fruit Loops, they're all the same oh flavor. God. None What'd of them you call me? Fr- 
<laughs> None of the Fruit Loops taste any different, which I no. learned later in life, and I was very disappointed. Um, but I have to say, I really, what I really enjoyed were um, what were they called? With Lucky the Charms. Yes. The marshmallows. Like, the do, you, do you see what's happening? Like, this is what was happening to, to, to myself and my brother and all the children in our neighborhood, I'm, su- I'm sure. And the parents were like, just eat what you want. But if you think about it, we basically started our day eating a couple of candy bars. Like, that's right. That's what we did. Yeah, but the marketing on it, the commercials and all the cartoon characters like Heather was talking about yeah. or, like, or that she brought up were are, like factored in. I think they really started targeting kids. <laughs> Um, so this is all very fascinating, but this also seems counterintuitive because here we are giving you a bowl of sugar, but also telling you at the same time, it's the most important meal of the day. So I can see how right. moms get manipulated into thinking, listen, I can't make you a delicious, healthy breakfast. So you have to eat something. So you may as well just eat cereal. So I can see how right. this went, Heather. It's kind mm-hmm. of interesting. Um, and I imagine that Kellogg uh, must have been really upset with this company now because, I mean... Maybe while the kids are eating cereal, the parents are having sex in the bedroom. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki! And it's My all goodness. flavorful, a- so it kind of it all backfired for Kellogg. <laughs> but um, anyway, Heather, I, was, I would love to know about the evolution of the um, American breakfast before the idea of bacon and eggs. Like, what did people eat back in the day? Like, back in the olden days, what did they eat? <laughs> back in the olden days? Well, people... In America, mostly ate the same stuff that they had been eating in England because, you know, like the first white people to show up were mostly British. And so they were eating the same kinds of foods, um, which was largely based on pork products and eggs. And that's, you know, just for the wealthier classes. Um, Working poor people ate whatever they'd had for dinner the night before, leftovers. A lot of Mm. um, the pioneer breakfasts were a lot of leftover cornbread mashed up with some milk and honey. And um, it's actually, it's interesting if you read the Little House in the Prairie books, it's a really beautiful snapshot of what um, turn of the 19th century diets looked like Mm. for people out in the West. Um, Yeah, the the richer people would have the the banquette loaded with chafing dishes of eggs and bacon and maybe some ham. Um, If they were still very British, they might eat kedgeree or some kind of like fishy rice, smoked fish, um, and then bread products. And um, as toasters became more sophisticated, toast became a much more prominent part of the table. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be that toast had to be like manually toasted by fire by a skilled maid and um, who didn't always (laughs) nail it, by the way. I can imagine. (laughs) And then um, as, you know, the migration of, of European settlers west of the Mississippi continued. Um, You see a little bit more integration with Native American foodways. You see much more corn in the diet. And um, and so it's really interesting to see that. The breakfast sandwich kind of started in England as a thing for the working class people to grab on their way to the the factory or the mines or whatever, but um, then was really embraced by cowboys um, in the western U.S., because it was something they could eat while they were working. And so you see this kind of um, parallel evolution of breakfast foods based on the needs of the people consuming them. And for the most part, rich people had the luxury of lounging around and just nibbling at things. And working class people had to eat something that was either handheld or cheap and filling. Right. Wow. That's interesting. And uh, the leftovers, too. That's interesting because, right, you have this whole meal from the night before, so why not just eat it for breakfast, right? But when I was younger, it was like, well, that's not breakfast food, right? Right. That's right. (laughs) I don't remember the breakfast burrito either when I was a kid. I I feel like that was a new invention later, right? I feel like it was, too. Well, breakfast tacos were around for sure. People ate and still eat egg tacos um, south of the border. Um, It's... (laughs) They're, they're very fast to make, they're cheap, um, mm-hmm. and they're delicious. That is true. Um, but, you know, my kid, he I have a 12-year-old son, and he eats leftovers for breakfast almost every day because my only rule for breakfast is it has to have fat, protein, and carbs. And so oh. that's usually, I don't care what else. I encourage him to, like, you can have Fruit Loops. It's a Saturday. Like, have Fruit <laughs> right. Loops and watch cartoons. And he's like, no, I just had some leftover pasta. <laughs> it's like, all right, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I love that kid. Well, pizza is really popular for breakfast, too. Oh, yeah. Pizza is a perfectly well-balanced breakfast, as long as there's, you know, it's it has, yeah, fat, protein, and carbs. <laughs> so, um, Heather, what does breakfast look like in other parts of the world? Oh. Like, what do people eat for breakfast? Well, a, a lot of places in the world stick with that, you know, leftovers are a breakfast. There's a lot of noodle soups overseas, and I think that's a really one. And that's usually what, if I'm craving food in the morning, I want to eat something brothy and 
noodly. Um, Especially in East Asia and Southeast Asia, you see a lot more soups at breakfast, which are great. You see porridge, which I think is, um, con- I consider porridge to be the international food. Um, it's eaten every in every country of the world, some version of a cooked grain or cereal um, with, you know, various toppings. It might be a corn or like maize porridge in West Africa. It might be rice porridges in East Asia. Um, corn porridge is also like atole and champorado in Southeast Asia and in uh, Mexico and South America. Um, bean porridges, you know, the peas porridge hot thing. Oh, yeah. And of course, we eat oatmeal here, which is in cream yeah. of wheat. Those are bowls of porridge. I like a good porridge. Remember the packets? Of, remember the, Nikki, remember the packets of oatmeal? That you just put in, you like heat up water. Oh, and what do you mean? You remember, I have in. them right now. Like, <laughs> oh my god! You're like remember, great, like, but they are filled with sugar. Are they? No, they're not. Well, oh, they probably the are. ones I ate Shit. were. <laughs> Let me go check. Hold on, I'll be right back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I actually, I'm a dork, uh, and I make, I soak my own oats. I make my own you cashew do? milk, and I soak them overnight with fresh berries. So I've definitely taken wow. the breakfast cereal to a whole new level because I do love the idea of something little porridgey with a little sweet in it. So mm-hmm. I, I've, I've tried to make it healthy. Um, Please, sir, can I have some more? <laughs> no. Okay, Heather. So the phrase <laughs> breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It has some dubious origins, but I have to know what is your opinion of this statement? Mm-hmm. I don't believe that breakfast is the most important meal of the day it, it, because not, I mean, I don't wake up hungry and I trust my body. That's, that's the, mm-hmm. d- the end of it. But um, for kids, you know, who do need energy in their little brains, um, people who are growing, um, which are children, people who have calories that they're going to be expending doing labor or, you know, exercise too, I guess. People who need the calories and wake up hungry should definitely eat breakfast. But I just don't believe in rules around meals. I think that for the most part, if you're a healthy person, Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, don't eat if you're not hungry. I don't eat before I exercise because nobody wants to work out with their stomach full of whatever sloshing around. It's it's not pleasant. (laughs) terrible. (laughs) That's true, though. Um, Heather, this has been so nice, but please don't go anywhere. Stick around, because we are about to talk to another guest who is going to give us her opinions on breakfast. I need to know that it's real. Know that it's real. So tell the truth. So she is a dietitian and nutritionist who encourages her clients to not let scales, food labels, diets, and the size of their pants dictate their lives. Preach. Please say hello to Connie Weissmuller. Hi, Connie. Hi, Connie. Hi. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the show. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. Happy to be here. (laughs) So in the old days, which is my favorite way to start every question. Yes. (laughs) In the old days. In the days. olden I don't days. Know why I love that. Like, in the, and how far back are you going in your head? Like like when there were carriages yeah, picture, or like, well, like wagons? Well, I even go back to wagons. House. Yeah, like old. I go back. I mean, every time I say olden days, no matter what time I'm talking about, in my mind, Laura Ingalls is there. Okay? All right. Yeah, Laura so Ingalls. So in the old days, a nutritionist was kind of seen as a buzzkill in a lab coat, right? Counting calories, forcing the uh, food pyramid on all of us. So I'm assuming that's not your approach, but what is your approach? You're so right. And I'm sorry to say we were and some of us still are buzzkills. That's certainly (laughs) not my approach. I'm not the food police. And I hope that people know that there are wonderful providers out there that will not use shame as a tactic to encourage you to eat, using air quotes, healthier. You know, so I really teach and counsel from a, a weight neutral lens which means I focus mostly on healthy behaviors for that individual rather than the weight on the scale or just blanket, you know, statements yeah. because each person is so um, so unique and we come from a variety of backgrounds and circumstances and they're, you just can't do a one-size-fits-all approach with nutrition. Right. I get that. Yeah. Connie, I've always heard this, right? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Obviously, we've heard it for years. It's kind of been pounded into our brains. But I've also heard at the same time that it's all right to skip breakfast. So as a nutritionist, are you a skipper or are you an eater? I am an eater. Mm. I Mm. wouldn't say my, my breakfast is elaborate by any means, nor do I expect my clients or anyone I counsel to have an elaborate breakfast. The idea is to just 
eat something to kind of get your body started. So really breakfast is this cool thing that adds fuel to our really kind of quiet uh, fire in the morning that is our metabolism and really kind of revs it up again. Okay. Which is a good thing to do. Okay. So let me ask you this. How soon after waking up should you be eating breakfast? Each person's different, but I would recommend about 90 minutes or so. That kind of gives you time to have your coffee, kind of chill, and then try and look for something, right? It could be as simple as a cheese stick in the morning with Mm -hmm. a granola bar. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's something that gets me going and allows me to have glucose to my brain and to my liver. I've got to replenish that glycogen that kind of kept us um, really, I almost want to say alive at night. Our our liver glycogen stores... Oh, interesting. I didn't know that part. Yeah. So basically, our liver stores carbohydrates. And as we're sleeping um, as a natural fast little bits of that glycogen are broken off so that our blood sugar will remain at a stable level. And when we wake up, that glycogen is rather depleted. So that's kind of the point of breakfast. It's to break the fast of your sleep. Okay. So going back to like that sugary cereal crap, like (laughs) even though it's something, would you recommend eating that for breakfast? Yeah. Or a donut. Yeah. I would say that there's No good or bad foods, right? That's my biggest philosophy. And I would recommend to do what what feels appropriate for people. What really, I encourage people to see what feels good in their body. So if Mm, you eat breakfast and or if you eat cereal, yeah, and you're like, wow, I feel actually kind of bleh. I feel like lethargic. That wasn't really good for me. Maybe we don't do cereal. Uh, Maybe an egg on toast is better for you or maybe something with whole grains and fiber to Mm. keep your blood sugar elevated a little bit longer is the best bet. So I don't think... There's a wrong way to eat breakfast. I, I like her. Hey, wait, you know what? If if I eat a donut, there's a psychological thing mm-hmm. about that mm-hmm. as far as bre- for breakfast, mm-hmm. because then I, I feel like I want to burn it off. Yeah. So it, it really does get me going, you know, and my body feels fine with it. Yep. Good. <laughs> you know? So Connie, what if you're just not hungry in the morning? You're just like, I don't, I don't want to think about food at all. Totally. Sometimes we don't need to eat then if it's going to make us super nauseous or if we're going to work out and feel like yeah. we need to vomit everywhere. <laughs> Not a great move. <laughs> However, I will say being an adult is stressful. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of things that we've learned throughout our life that have kind of made our hunger cues uh, a lot quieter in the mornings. I mean, think about it. We wake up and we're immediately stressed, right? We have like emails right. to deal with or a school drop off or whatever. Yeah. The natural response to our stress hormone is to not be hungry. So oh. in many people, it is a learned adaptation to not be hungry in the morning. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Maybe me that's what's too. going on wow. with me. Malone, maybe that's you. <laughs> it is me. <laughs> or if you eat a lot at night, if you're kind of like a late dinner eater, which is fine, your stomach doesn't shut off at you know seven or eight, uh, and then you have a snack maybe before bed, you might have kind of just loaded in your energy in the evening. And so you're waking up and you're like, oh, I still kind of got some left over, which is fine. Okay. I lo- That's me. Okay. And it's not just a snack. It's like snack yeah, at snacks. night. So I'm full. Like I'm fine in the morning. Yeah. And that's, it's okay. Everybody's body is unique to them. However, we do have similar machinery, right? And um, that that stress adaptation or just avoidance of, of eating in general because we live in a culture that promotes dieting and restriction so much can right. lead to inaccurate hunger and fullness cues. I need to know that it's real. Know that it's real. So tell the truth. Okay, this is where I want to dig in here because I wake up in the morning and I am hungry, but I resist it and I don't eat Mm -hmm. and I have my tea and then I kind of push Mm -hmm. myself until noon because when I eat breakfast, I feel like to me, Connie, and tell me if I'm crazy, it triggers my eating for the rest of the day. Meaning as soon as I eat a delicious breakfast, I feel like 45 minutes later, I'm ready for a snack. And then I'm thinking about lunch. And then I'm thinking, so to me, it just triggers this constant craving of food. Yeah. What is that about? What happens there? What do you think? Well, I think my, my first question for you is, are you eating something that hits all the food groups and is balanced if you are hungry in the morning? Because there's a reason we need protein, carbs, fat, and a color, right? That's my kind of go-to Wait, phrase. Wait, you said protein, carbs, protein, fat. Protein, carbs, fat, and a color. 
and a That color. would be the ideal balanced mm. meal, right? Like a piece of fruit or some berries thrown on there, veggies, whatever, because um, that's typically a source of fiber along with our whole grains. Okay. So sometimes people are, will, will grab like a, a bar or an apple or something, and that's great. However, there's nothing really to sustain you oh, with that's just interesting. eating an apple. No, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. right. So if you or put, a banana. Yep. Have you eaten a banana and then you're like hungry an hour 100%. later? hundred percent. That banana didn't do anything. It does nothing, right? Easy so, access though. Yeah, quick carbs. So that's great if you're yeah. about to do a morning workout. That's oh. actually an ideal situation. But the idea would be if you wanted to make that more complete to say, all right, what am I missing? So if you're going to choose a piece of fruit, can you add a little like slab of peanut butter on there or some nuts or have a hard boiled mm-hmm. egg. So that's how you can build oh, up. Oh, okay. Now this is starting to make more sense. Mm-hmm. No wonder because if I think I'm robbing myself of what I actually need. So my body's like, hey, I'm still hungry because it still needs something. Mm-hmm. Oh. Right. Mm-hmm. And my second question for you would be, I wonder why you've been conditioned to be fearful of eating, right? It sounds like when you said that phrase, oh, I'm like craving food or craving a snack. Why is that bad? Because I... Right? We've been taught. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. We've been taught that food's bad or being hungry is bad when yeah, see? the it's truth is, is that it's just another body cue. And we can trust them. We just live in a society with so much external validation, like a step counter or like a calorie counter, my fitness pal, Noom, you right. name it. It takes us so far away from our internal cues. So we just mm. learn to not trust them anymore. <gasps> That's Connie. right. And it's all about money. It, I love that yeah. because it's all about money. You know what I mean? A yep. lot of this. It is. And, uh, oh, for sure. I always believe in listening to your body. Yep. And I think that's a great uh, tactic. It's like what I help people do. And sometimes it feels really difficult to trust our body after many years, potentially, of not trusting it. Right. So don't feel bad if it's hard at first. Okay. And if you need some support, finding a dietitian who specializes in, you know, um, helping people attune to their body cues it might be really helpful for a couple sessions to be really like, really oh, good. Advice. Yeah, maybe I have been avoiding mm-hmm. food, or maybe I have, I do have some rules around carbohydrates or sugar or whatever. Right. And you got to kind of unlearn those first and then really re implement those trusting behaviors. It's so those. good. This is so layered. It's it way more than so breakfast. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's about programming too from our childhood. Right. Like, yep. you know, even our parents saying, like, you know, my mom, like, y- you can't have that cereal. It's bad for you. Yep. You know, oh, for sure. And, Right, realizing our parents did the best that they could. Yeah. And we kind of end up sometimes as adults like, oh no, why do I want to finish my plate? Like, right. where did I learn that? <laughs> yes. Really? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I have to ask you, Connie, are there health benefits to eating breakfast? Like, what does science say? Yes. Aside from replenishing our liver glycogen, mm-hmm. right, and, and filling the, the tank that's almost empty, it's another way to think about it. Mm-hmm. I think breakfast is wonderful because a lot of the times if we're skipping an essential meal like breakfast, we might not be meeting our nutrient needs with just lunch and dinner, especially Mm. if you're not a snacker. So you could be missing out on key vitamins and minerals or not meeting your carbohydrate needs or protein needs, and then kind of just ending up feeling a little bit off towards the end of the day. Right. So I think it's great to get your optimal nutrition. It also helps your body be consistent with providing accurate hunger and fullness cues. It likes Our bodies don't like to be surprised. They like consistency. So having that breakfast and then something about three to four hours later, like a snack or a, if that happens to fall at lunch, cool. Our bodies really like that. It's like, oh, c- cool. We're not in crisis. We don't have to conserve anything extra. We can just burn what we need to burn, store what we need to store and move forward. doesn't need to be that big of a deal. All right. So what about lunch and dinner? Like, are they important from a nutritionist? standpoint? Or are they just kind of like hanging out going, go ahead, breakfast. You you got this. (laughs) 100% they're important. Three meals a day on average plus snacks um, are the way that we're able to meet our macro and micronutrient needs. We just can't get it all done if we just eat one giant meal a day. Right. It's not really possible. So yes, they're important for concentration, for making sure we have sustained energy throughout the day, and just, again, meeting those, those nutrient needs. Yeah. So I've been kind of digging into this lately because I've been doing I've been doing things that were very, that are very fad, right? Like oh, I'm going to try the intermittent fasting. Oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to count mm-hmm. calories. I've been all over the place. Nothing consistent and nothing's been working. So I'm throwing it all out the window. Um, and just I think the body cues, the hunger cues, are really right. important. But they a are. few studies that I've seen suggest that breakfast really isn't that important, and that it doesn't actually affect things like weight gain or energy loss. So where do you stand yeah. on that? You know, I've done a lot of reading of research and 
you can pretty much find studies that validate anything, right? Science is <laughs> right. It yeah. can be really contradictory. It's true. It's true. So again, seeing what feels best for you and understanding, I think it's helpful to understand uh, digestion, kind of the physiology of the body. And if you consistently feel really yucky after breakfast, maybe it isn't for you. Mm-hmm. But to your point about, you know, it doesn't breakfast and weight gain and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I think the just the concept of using our weight as a dipstick for health needs to go away because being a certain weight or falling within a certain BMI quartile doesn't tell me anything about a person's health or their behaviors. So Hmm. I would much rather know how they take care of themselves through food, through movement. Do they sleep enough? How are their stress levels? Rather than anything about the number on a scale. Got it. To be honest. Connie, I'm loving this. This is a good, like it's like recentering ourselves a little bit. Yes. So sweet Connie. (laughs) <laughs> Would you agree with the statement that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? I think there's a lot of nuance with nutrition. So yeah, it is important, but you know, we're going to wake up late and scramble around and miss breakfast. Okay, not the end of the world. It's okay. And so on a Sunday morning, you're going to your favorite breakfast spot, Connie. What you getting? Well, if I'm good and hungry, I'm probably going to get Eggs Benedict. Ooh, it's my favorite. Right? Something about hollandaise mm. sauce. So good. Oh. Um. Or I'm a really big, like, breads person. Any type mm. of croissant, oh, yes, like, yes, a, yes. like a good donut yes. and like a yummy, yes. like, third coffee of the day mm-hmm. sounds really good to me. <laughs> like, I just yeah. really yeah. enjoy carbohydrates is what I'm trying to say. Girl, me <laughs> yep. too. Me too. Right? <laughs> Connie, thank you so much. I have to say I love your thoughts on nutrition and breakfast. It's very helpful. So thank you. But don't go anywhere because right now... We have something pretty special planned. So Heather, oh. Connie, and Malone, get ready <laughs> yeah. because we are going to play a little bonus quiz. I'm going to give you the name of a famous cereal mascot. You tell me oh. what cereal they're repping, right? They okay. start out easy and they get harder. Oh, God. So when you think you know, just blurt it out and somebody's keeping score, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Lucky the Leprechaun. Lucky Charms. Ooh, uh, Lucky uh, Charms. Ooh. Lucky Charms. Wait, who got that? Connie. I think Connie got it. Who is that? I stumbled. We Connie got it. We split a tie. Tony the Tiger. Frosted Frost Flakes. Oh, my God. You're all answering at the same time. You sound like you're in a chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who got I'm so that. stressed. I'm sweating. <laughs> oh, I think that was a tie for everybody. Snap, crackle, and pop. Rice Krispies. Rice Krispies. Oh, Rice Krispies. Oh. Rice nice Rice job. I think that was up. I think that was up. Oh, other. I am on it today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Silly Rabbit. Tricks, tricks for, for kids. kids. Oh, oh my oh. gosh, Con- Wait, what was it? <laughs> tricks. I think oh, Heather tricks. and Connie got that as, a, that as a tie. Okay, this one's hard. Um, Sunny the Cuckoo Bird. Oh, Fruit um, Fruit Loops. Cocoa. Co- no, that's a Toucan Sam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you're right. Wait, did you say Cocoa Fruit Loops? Malone, did you say Cocoa is- Puffs? Cuckoo said, for Cocoa, Cocoa Puffs. Puffs. Yeah. Malone, you're right. Oh my gosh, <gasps> oh my that was my and favorite. I, n- I never even ate those. <laughs> <laughs> that's your homework. I've never even tried those. I ate those. And then I drank the milk after. Oh, sure, milk. right? Oh, yeah, because yes. it's chocolate milk. My That's neighbor excellent. used to do that. <laughs> okay, Childhood number memories. six, Fred Flintstone. Pebbles. Mm, yeah. Pebbles. Yep, yeah, you got it. Fruity Pebbles. All right, Malone, you got it. Malone, I'm proud of you. Toucan Sam. <laughs> Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. Nice. <laughs> Who was that? Was that Connie or Heather? That was me. No, it was Heather. Okay, it was all right, Heather. Heather. Good job, good job. Okay, finally, the last one. <laughs> Buzz the Bee. The honey Nut what? Cheerios? Yes, Honey Nut Cheerios. Oh, my yes. God. Those are good. Oh. I like those. Those are my second. Good case. job. Good they're, job, Connie. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're really good. Thanks. They are still good. Look at Heather. She's done <laughs> good job. <laughs> okay. I cannot believe this. This is a tie between Connie and Heather. Woo! Congratulations. Woo. <laughs> Thanks a lot, cool Good job, world. Connie. <laughs> good job. And you both win a lifetime supply of sugary cereal that'll have you crash by 11 every single day. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh my God, Nikki. <laughs> you don't win anything except our love. Oh my gosh, that was so much fun. So I want to say thank you to our wonderful guest, Heather Arndt Anderson. Thank you for being on the show today. We're so grateful. Thank you for having me. I could talk about this all day. I love it. Uh, mm-hmm. If you want to follow Heather on Instagram, it's just Heather Arndt. Anderson, A-R-N-D-T is the middle name. And uh, Connie Weissmuller, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I had so much fun. Uh, we learned so much. And if you want to follow Connie, yeah. it's Constantly Eating. That's Constance, her name, with the L-Y. And then Eating. That's so creative. I love that. Oh, thank you all so, so much for being on the show today. So Maloney, how does it feel to know mm-hmm. the answer to your question? 
Nikki, it feels wonderful. <laughs> I'm so happy I was validated about having a donut in the morning. <laughs> That's what you're excited about. So here's the deal. I'm just going to pick you up. We're going to go get some French toast and a yeah. donut, but I'll wait till around 11 so you're not mad about it. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, I'll see you in a little bit. Love you. Okay, love you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so is breakfast the most important meal of the day? Even though most of the notions we have about breakfast started out as clever marketing ploys and weren't really based on any science or common sense, there's still some wisdom in those words. Eating breakfast does seem to have a number of metabolic benefits that can affect your long-term health, and it can make you more focused and energetic. But you won't die if you skip it. So, is breakfast the most important meal of the day? No. Science has yet to agree on this, but I can tell you, it's definitely in the top three. Okay, that's our show for today. Hey, tell us what questions are on your mind. Send us a voice memo, or you can email us at callmecurious at wondery.com. Or you can even hit me up on Instagram at Nikki Boyer. I would love to hear from you and get to the bottom of all your questions. Because I don't know stuff too. From Wondery, I'm your host, Nikki Boyer. Our theme song is Tell the Truth by Yana. Thanks to Mr. Malone for joining me on today's show. And thank you to our guests, Heather Arndt Anderson and Connie Weismuller for helping us dig into breakfast. New episodes drop every Thursday. Rich Goodman is our senior producer. Gary Lucy and Polly Stryker, producers. Our associate producer is Jayha Joshua Chang. Our editor is Steve Mazur. Scott Velasquez, music supervisor for Freeze on Sing. Dax Jordan is our person on the street. Sam Ada, Rob Spate, and Danny Bringer are our engineers. And Tina Rubio and Marshall Louie are the executive producers for Wondery. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week. And remember, stay curious.